Welcome everybody to your bi-weekly Corbinless episode of oh. Brainstorm Brewery. Oh, you are so welcome. We are Corbinless this week, which means no Corbin. It means a better episode. It means uh, it means no complaining about Merfolk being unplayable. It means we'll get some uh, real knowledge, some real magic, the gathering financial knowledge. We'll, we got some fizziness in the background there. That is... Your primary host, Jason E. Alt, cracking open a cold beverage. What do you got there, Jason? Uh, I have a La Croix because I'm observing Sober October. Gotcha. Because it hurt to pee. No, that's not true. I don't I don't <laughs> think that my alcoholism was damaging my body more than normal, per se. I just uh, wanted to pump the brakes a little bit. And there's no point in doing it if you're not going to do it for the whole month. So uh, I'm continuing, and it has not been difficult, and I'm glad that it wasn't difficult. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, this is your other host, DJ Johnson. Uh, I am a buyer for 95MTG. I have uh, a relatively large amount of magic finance knowledge, buying and selling wizard squares. Uh, and to add to that experience and birth of Magic the Gathering financial knowledge, we have a guest. We have John... Uh, a store manager from the Atlanta downtown slash suburban area, I guess you'd call it. Uh, yeah, you run a, North the city. You run a relatively large store operation, and you're relatively active in our Brainstorm Brewery Discord, which can be found at patreon.com slash brainstorm brewery, uh, where you keep telling people to buy 200 soul rings. And I read that five or six times, and I was like, yep, this guy knows what he's doing. So yep. here we are. Yeah, uh, soul rings are always awesome. And it's the easiest way to make money. It is, it is the least flashiest way to make money, which is not what it, everybody wants. The the hot next tip of uh, what the next format's going to be or what the next unbanded card is. Everybody wants to be able to tell that story around the LGS campfire. But the, the tried and true method of making money in Magic is either A, buying very boring cards that sell very quickly. Or B, sitting a bunch of Jeskai Ascendancies in a box for 18 years until you finally are vindicated. So, uh... I mean, telling people to buy soul rings is the MTG finance equivalent of being like, hey, you want free money? Go mow your neighbor's lawns for money. Or like in, buy a CD or, or like, yeah. yeah. And then and then they just don't do it and they complain that their spec box is overflowing. I bought all these Okos at $30 like you told me and now they're $35 and I'm losing money selling them on a TCG player. What the hell? They're 64 yeah, we're on TCG player today, so. For the regular version? Yep. Whoops. Cool. That's fine. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather tell people to not buy that card and then be right 80% of the time than have them lose money on it by telling them to buy it. Well, the first thing that happened was the banner restricted list came out, and the fact that Oka was not on it meant that everyone's like, oh, well, we were nervous about it getting a ban. It didn't. Uh, I really didn't anticipate people being like, oh, we think it's going to get banned. Uh, of course it's not going to get banned. You know? Yeah, it's it's very difficult to ban a marquee planeswalker from a set, regardless of how powerful it is. Uh, Especially it would if it have came to be, out two weeks ago. Yeah, it, that card would have to be truly like memory jar levels of egregious uh, before it would warrant an emergency ban like that, just because it is the the namesake seller of the set. It's a new character. It's just so many um, things going for it beyond just its lines of text that provide it tournament playability. Like it would have to be very, very, very it would have to be like 90% of the, it'd have to be like a skull clamp situation. Before and it they was the so that card. obvious to me that it wasn't going to get banned uh, today, which is Monday um, that I didn't even anticipate the price spiking, you know, when it didn't get banned because it was never going to. Yeah. I think even if it was the 75% of the MC that they would just, even if they realized there's a problem, they were going to choose something else. You know, if it's a blue-green card, Hydroid Crisis would, or like have been, Nissa, would, have, would have been the or... sacrifice. You know, the, they're not willing, under probably any circumstance, to blow the marquee Mythic Planeswalker from their newest set. Even Correct. if it is 100% the reason that everything's gone to shit. Well, yeah. uh, if they did, then the new marquee Mythic play, uh, card from the set would be Embercleave, which is a card we, on this podcast, said we thought. It was pretty damn good. And you guys yeah, were spot I, I, on because it flew through the roof. I ended up backpedaling on that card on Twitter, so uh, I I can't really take any credit for it because I 
I pulled a smuggler's copter where I read that card and I was like, this is really good. And then right when the podcast came out, there were a bunch of pros saying like, Embercleave's garbage, Red's unplayable, don't buy this card. I was like, all right, yeah, they're, they're right, they're right. Don't buy Embercleave, guys. And then, uh... Yeah, well, I doubted myself because I was like, Smuggler's Copter seems like a really good card and it's only a couple bucks. I must not understand anything about magic. And it turns out it's everyone else who was wrong. Uh, I thought the odds of that were pretty remote, but sometimes you're right and everyone else but you is wrong. Yes. You just got to use your use your gut. You guys are majority of the time right. And, uh, you know, for every one you miss, it, the rest of them make uh, the people who listen an awful lot of money. Yeah. Well, the stakes and are I'm, so low for us because we don't really speculate that much. You know, it's it's not. Yeah, our, I, our I version it, of speculating yeah, yeah. is I'm, like buy, buying a card at BuyList and then throwing it in a box and d- deciding not to sell it so that even if we do sell it later without the card spiking, we're still netting the number we originally wanted. I spend like a couple hundred bucks a month on specs and that's it. Most of the money I make is just buying soul rings and selling soul rings type of stuff, the really unsexy stuff. So, you know, um, when it comes to specs, it's sometimes we're like, eh, we don't really know. So um, that's what happened. Field of the Dead was banned. That was kind of predictable. And okay, Astrolabe was, was, yeah, yeah, Astro was banned in Pauper, which everybody sort of expected, and that one doesn't really have any other financial implications. But the other big announcement uh, that was a very, very, very big announcement was that all of you who claimed and clamored for frontier have finally gotten your way um you were right all along nothing about what you said was wrong at all frontier is the perfect magic format it just took wizards uh 750 days to realize that and now all those siege rhinos that you got in a box are going to be worth money unless they are because yes. that card's not good in a format so we with have no we have a format called pioneer which, uh, for those who have declined to listen to the announcement or stuck your heads in the sand or just don't really interact with Magic very much anymore, uh, Pioneer is a non-rotating format. So they described it as not an eternal format. It is a non-rotating format that starts at Return to Ravnica going forward. It only includes standard legal sets, so there's no Modern Horizons. You don't get to play your Commander deck cards in there. Uh, you don't get to include any other ancillary products, but it starts at Return to Ravnica going forward all the way up until Throne of Eldraine, and then it bans the five fetches as the only card. So you don't get to play Windswept Teeth and it's uh, four brethren, but every other card is legal right now in this format from RTR going forward, which means Deathrite Shaman, which means Dig Through Time, which means Aetherworks Marvel, Emrakul, Ulamog, uh, just any sort of standard banned card in the past few years is legal in this format that goes back to 2012. And their logic for creating this format is just that, I mean, modern's been a thing since around 2011, and back then it was just the the bridge between legacy and standard, they invented modern, and now, uh, because modern is no longer this format where you get to play your old standard cards, because that's what it was at the time, uh, they wanted a new format where you could just play your old standard cards that have rotated, your player tireless trackers, your, your voice resurgences, your all these, uh, these binder dust gathering cards. And so now we have pioneer and we have seen a plethora of card spikes from this announcement. Yep. It's uh it's Monday and it's already too late to get on on the obvious stuff. Uh, but yes. when we get into this a little bit later in the episode, I think we're going to delve into some actionable stuff, what we think could be a thing because, you know, it's on the basis of, uh, you know, the stuff that people are building and not, you know, speculating on just bec- on the basis of what was good and standard before. Um, and, uh, I can tell you a lot of people are super hyped about the format and I, I can see that as a, as someone who sees our inventory move sales are on cards. I would never expect have sold are, are flying out of the doors. It's one of the most hype things to happen in magic in a long time. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. And I think my sales are, uh, similarly hyped to support that data just because there's, I think this announcement is even just helped a lot by the fact that Standard has been miserable the past few weeks. Like, it's just the perfect time for something to swoop in and save people from just uh, two miserable formats. That, don't, that Somebody played in a weekly tournament and died to Paradoxical Urza on turn three, and then they played in their Standard deck and played three Oko Mirrors, and now this comes around and everybody's gears start turning about brewing and playing these cards they, they haven't gotten a chance to in, like, five or six years. Smuggler's Copters and uh, Tireless Trackers and all these crazy dig through times and it, it feels a lot like modern when it was introduced. Yeah. You know, I was playing legacy and I was kind of bored with legacy and standard was fine, 
but it's the new world. It's the opportunity to, to actually get out and use something that a lot of people don't do. And that's their brain to brew and figure stuff out on their own. And, it's, and that's such a exciting thing for enfranchised players because they don't get to do it. They just open up the, the internet and pick the deck list at one. Now they can have a chance. Yeah, it's something supported by Wizards, too, because new formats popping up is sort of a bi-monthly thing at this point. Somebody wants to start their own grassroots format, they make Canadian tiny Highlander leaders or whatever, and, I mean, people will brew and people will theorycraft and just sort of move cards around on uh, Magic Online or just sort of, like, typed up deck list and notepad, but nobody actually really, like, goes hard on the cards and is like, yes, I'm going to play this, this is having Grand Prix support, this is having... uh, magic online support uh and this is just a full shove by wizards saying like this is going to be a new thing it is uh standing on par with standard and modern it's in your face right now yeah PT- ptqs or whatever they're called now are starting on november 1st for this format and next year's gp schedule formats have already been released and there's for q1 uh, yeah phoenix q1. phoenix and, is in february and uh that's a pioneer gp yeah which is insane it, Wizards is putting their weight behind it, and that's, like we said, the, there's so many different formats popping up, but now Wizards is full-blown behind it, and there's GP, and there's money on the line, and a real opportunity to, to win big. It, it's it's going to drive the community go even harder. Yep. So, uh, in the spirit of Pioneer, uh, I, I'm sh- I didn't really tell you to prep this, but uh, normally we drop... A seamless segue into Breaking Bulk every week, so that's what I'm doing right now. Just this seamless uh, cast iron segue right into the Breaking Bulk part of the podcast, where we tell you about a card that is worth money that you would not normally think is money. It is something that you might find in your collection, digging through Bulk, pulling out uh, Pioneer staples. These are cards that even if you have no intention of playing Pioneer, may be worth a significantly more money than you paid for them originally, or just more money than zero. Uh, so this is a fun little guessing game for those who are new to the podcast where we give clues and hints about the particular card that we have chosen for this game, and then the other co-hosts have to uh, flounder around and guess what it is. Or in Corbin's case, just guess sets that are decades off. Like, I'll I'll pull this Ixalan card out. I've got an Ixalan blue card in my hand right now. I'll give him some clues, and I'll be like, uh, uh, treachery! And then we'll be like, no, Corbin, that's not how this works. Breaking bolt time. Breaking bolt time. Break, break, break. Oh, yeah, Breaking Bulk. There's so much good stuff. It's a pick. Breaking Bulk. The end. Uh, so speaking of that, I have a Ixalan Blue Uncommon. That I feel could be a valuable card draw engine in the face of Pioneer. A curious Obsession? Good guess, but no. That one's actually Rivals. So that's... I don't, fault you for, I don't fault you for getting that one Chart wrong, though. Course. Those two sets are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chart of Course. Chart of course is two mana blue, blue and a colorless, draw two cards. Sometimes you have to discard a card, sometimes you don't, but it is a valuable card draw engine that also is uh, pairing up with Treasure Cruise, Dig Through Time, and a lot of other graveyard fuel spells. a lot of other spells. day one bands. Like, I think people are getting a little bit ahead of themselves on the, the stuff because a lot of the stuff is a good spec and a lot of the stuff people buying is just going to be banned day one, so... I don't know if they're going to wait for a tournament or if they're just going to be like, hey, look, we're we're monitoring the format. And before, like, a paper event even happens, we've noticed the lists from people dicking around online and we're absolutely going to ban these cards. So That's exactly what uh, Aaron Forsyth said. He said they're going to use the uh, the Magic Online data, and if you can't afford to have a card banned, you should, you should buy it. Basically yeah, I said. mean, there there are death rate shamans on TCG Player right now for like thirteen dollars, and I don't think that's a card that's going to get banned because again, fetch lines are banned in the format. So, uh, this is definitely a format similar to like when Stoneforge Mystic gets unbanned, where you don't want to be that person buying into the hype and just sort of clicking your keyboard crazily. Uh, just trying to get all these new play sets of staples that are their inflated prices because, like, I'm happy to sell Death Rites at 13, but if you're listening to this cast, you shouldn't want to buy them at 13. You should stay away from the six or seven dollar smugglers copters. You should stay away from all of the uh, the forty dollar expensive... Jace Friends prodigies. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Here's what he said: the only cards banned in Pioneer at its inception are the fetch lands, but I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't true for long. We'll be managing the format aggressively and off cycle based on MTGO results. In advance of the first tabletop premiere events next year. Pass it on. So that's saying, hey, you know, don't get too excited. And I, I, I think, you know, speculation is a risk. So just know that uh, it's a risk. Yeah. 
So uh, Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time are legal, but they might not be... I don't think Charter Course is going anywhere. It's just a nice little Exelon card that you can find in your bulk, and then you get, like, 15 cents piece for it on BIOS or something like that. It's just a nice little thing to find in bulk that Pioneer players may be looking for in the near future. It's uh, it's also a card that moves very quickly. Uh, it's also, it's also We're always out of stock, and uh, we sell a lot of them to casual players for yeah. their EDH deck. It's it's a good loot engine and some card advantage. Yes, it is it is definitely one of those cards that fits very nicely into like the the 60 card unsleeved slash like casual pile of like I'm going to play my Delver of Secrets and then my Chart of Course and then my build my $20 budget casual deck that has a reasonable power level. Whatever, man. More like fart a horse, am I right? <laughs> okay, I got one. This is uh from the same block. This is a black rivals of Ixalan creature and it's not Ch- predicated on pioneer it's predicated on edh is it chupi no not chupacabra he's not chupacabra that's too obvious you don't get those in bulk is it uh the treasure like the whenever a creature dies you get a treasure pitiless plunderer whenever another creature you control dies create a colorless treasure artifact token it is on the basis of corval the fake hearse being the number two most built commander on EDH rec this week goes Alela. Alela has been number one what? for three weeks. It's it goes Alela. What would you, Corval, what would you do if I told you you picked this in, in July? Really? Yeah. Um, I, okay. I still get them in bulk. That's fine. I got a backup. Okay. Wait, how, how do you happen to check the previous <laughs> picks or breaking bulk? Is there a spreadsheet? You're better that, at this uh, people than have Corbin. Access to? Jesus, our guest is a better at <laughs> doing a Patreon <laughs> pitch than Corbin is. That's fantastic. Uh, what DJ did was he went to a spreadsheet that uh, patrons who go to patreon.com slash brainstorm brewery and give us as little as $5 a month, which is a dollar t- or a dollar 25 an episode. Oh, it's it's ten dollars. Spreadsheet's ten. That, that's that makes sense. Um, the the spreadsheet has all our picks of the week and our breakings bulk, and you can have access to that the second we update it when we record on Monday night. And you don't have to wait uh, till Friday with all the pours getting our picks a week later. So it's good value if you are someone who is inclined to buy on our our picks of the week and pick on the basis of our breakings bulk. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash brainstorm brewery. Give us as little as $2 or $2 and 50 cents an episode for access to the spreadsheet. And if you can't make $2 a week, getting our advice a week before everybody else, then I, you're not trying. So that's and this, fun. this spreadsheet goes all the way back to 2017 and also has a magical pick of the week tracker that inputs all our picks of the week and shows who's winning and who's losing. Assuming you pick one of each card up every single weekend. Well, I have an so, uncommon from Ice Age that is black Ice and red. Age. Black and red, Ice Age uncommon. Get these in bulk all the time. Oh, Go, this is the... Ghostly Flame? Is, no, 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 no. It's oh. uh, it's the one of the stupid dragon on it. I, play, I played it in Marchesa forever because it goes with dragon. Yeah, Draven, you pay life. It kills it's you. Fire Covenant. Uh, I yeah, got, Fire Covenant. Uh, I bought bulk, and you don't get Ice Age bulk a lot. I get that, but I understand that. But, like... Somebody picked all the demonic consultations and the, you know, the Finhorn elves and the the Mystic Remoras, but there was a stack of three dollar fire covenants in there, and I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, this is really good with Grevin. It's really good with any commander that uh, doesn't really care about its own life total. Um, it's just like I used to play at Marchesa because you could just kill people's entire board. You're like, okay, all your blockers are dead. I'll take fifteen. I'm not on the throne now. Getcha. Um, but it works with Grevin too because Grevin will kill them really quickly. Yeah. It it uh it's seen some legacy play, uh not that matters. Rip legacy as like a one of in Death Shadow. Yeah, the Shadow decks and then some of the four color Grixis decks as as ways to you know clean up young pyromancers or other creatures. Yep, that seems real Makes good. Makes sense. But yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. Pitiless Plunderer is something I picked earlier, but it's definitely reared its head again. Uh, another card that was a breaking bulk of mine, Pawn of Ulamog, is up to like two bucks on tcg player on the basis of uh corvald so that's another card that i can't keep in stock yep you know pitiless plunder pawn of ulamong and playcrafter the the three p's of uh of corvald so um you know pick your bulk and uh you know go back through your bulk periodically i guess so i actually did a little uh homework and uh this isn't quite for pioneer this is something we sell a lot and i see all the time in Customers bringing in their bulk. 
It's a Rivals of Ixalan Uncommon Black Sorcery. Uh, I was going to guess the Demonic Tutor, but that's a rare. Rivals of Ixalan Black Sorcery and... I hear typing. That's not me. That was me to make sure I'm not an idiot and wrote it down wrong. Why are you typing? Uh, it's your card. Yeah, because I might have wrote the wrong uh, <laughs> sorcery or instant. It is a sorcery. Uh, it's Arterial Flow. Really? It Buy list for five cents on Card Kingdom. Uh, oh, people, yeah. This is the mind rot that drains them, right? Yeah. When, uh, when people bring in their rotated rivals and, and such cards, these are so plentiful. And they retail on TCG for... 15 to 20 cents direct can get up to 25, 30 cents, which is what we sell. Uh, every time I put them in, they are gone within two to three days. So why is the price higher? You thinking that it, there's pressure on it to go up soon? Uh, well, direct pricing is different than regular. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's just one of the super casual cards. It says Vampire, and it's a mine yeah. rot. And... Uh, but there's so even with all those copies just snap selling like it, you know there's there's so many copies of an uncommon from a set that's a couple years old. Uh, I I can't explain why casuals buy cards. I just know that I love when they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, minor segue here. Uh, TCG player direct pricing tends to be a little higher than non direct pricing, and that means that players who are looking specifically to get all their cards one package are generally willing to pay a little bit more for that so sort of like the, it's almost like the card kingdom method where if you look up card kingdom's prices they tend to be a lot higher than other competitors like channel fireball like tcg player uh hintity hint hint buy cards at channel fireball that's the ad read Channel Fireball has the best content. Uh, except did you get, did did you get the ad from Corbin, or was like he not here? Because like Channel Fireball <laughs> has generously uh, uh, decided to sponsor this podcast, which uh, is super cool of them. And um, them being our sponsor allowed us to have that party at the at a Grand Prix, and I think that's something we'll do next year. So we like the partnership with Channel Fireball, but apparently it's real loose because they're sort of like yeah. You don't have to use their prices, but it'd be great if you did occasionally and read this ad. And we don't know the ad. So if I'm guessing, it's um, Channel Fireball has like a 5% off sale this week. That's a thing that's true. Channel Fireball is in line with other websites and is occasionally cheaper. Um, they have a 40% trade-in bonus right now is the big oh, one, Jason. That's the yeah. draw. Well, yeah, that's there's that too. Cool. That's a thing that you should but, know about. Yes. So uh, the general rule of what I was saying is that Card Kingdom is a little higher because they offer sort of like a premium retail experience, experience is the word I'm going to use. Uh, and TCG Player Direct sort of falls into that line. So if you are a reasonably high volume TCG Player seller yourself and you're looking to move into Direct and you're worried about the additional fees, you can actually offset that a decent uh, percentage by increasing your prices to compensate because pay players are willing to pay more for the Direct experience. So there are cards where all TCG Mid is like $7.50 and I can list it for $8.50 and it'll still sell at a reasonable amount of time. That is what John is talking about with Arterial Flow because you look at that card and you're like, 18 cents, that's not really worth it. But there are some 18 cent cards you just list it for 35 cents and it still goes. Yep. Uh, one caveat to um, Card Kingdom, we talk about Card Kingdom having such a generous buy list that like, if you're going to buy list to them and take a big premium and then just get the store credit and buy the cards back out, even if they are a little bit more expensive on Card Kingdom, you know, it's still worth it with the trade-in. But Card Kingdom has said recently that, I don't know if it's the result of the 2016 election or not, I can't prove that it is, but they are going to start charging sales tax on their sales whether they didn't before if you're out of state so um all of a sudden that's a, a little bit more of a percentage that's like five or six or seven percent um suddenly that you're losing if you're going to uh, those, are, those are those are cute numbers jason i live in new york <laughs> yeah well i mean you have to use that money we're like 8.75 percent here bud well, hey, man, that that money goes to, that uh, Governor Cuomo can hire a bunch of cops with no body cams to patrol the subway. So, like, that 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 8.75%, it's not like you're not getting anything for that. Um, yeah, so Channel Fireball, or uh, uh, 
So Card Kingdom is now charging sales tax where they didn't before. So if you're trading your cards in and you know getting the the bonus and then buying the cards from them, uh, you just lost a big chunk and it's made their buy list a little bit less attractive. So that's a thing you should know. I'm not advocating stopping doing business with Card Kingdom, but um, that's a, a thing that has changed recently and it affects you. That's a good point. Yeah. We know what we're talking about on this podcast. So yeah, we uh, we talked a little bit, John, about what your what your day in the life of a card store manager was like coming in on such a huge announcement. But I mean, I spent a lot of today just like digging through backstock of like Oath of the Gate Watch and Shadows Over Innistrad, just being like, I wonder what's in here that I can sell for three hundred percent today. So what was your day like? Considering you probably have a more significant inventory than I do. Yeah. Uh... I, uh, I vended the event this weekend, so my plan today was to sleep in and get some sleep. Uh, luckily, a, a community member called me, so I got to the store real quick. Uh, our process, we sat down. My two card monkeys are actual Magic players. They try real hard. They, they are qualified for large events. And we started going back through old standard format, starting at RTR. What decks were the best? What cards stood out? What were more powerful? Made the list, and... First thing we did was start repricing the obvious stuff. You know, we hit the Jace Friends Prodigies, the collective companies. And then we started going deck list by deck list. Is this viable? What do you think of this? What do you think of this? Once we had our list, we uh, went to work digging through our library of inventory to be listed online. And my philosophy on when things are spiking, just like you guys, I want to sell them to the hype. I don't care if Jace Friends Prodigy goes to 50. If I can sell them at 40 right now, guaranteed... Let it fly. Uh, so we spent all day just brainstorming decks, brainstorming good cards, and changing prices. And it, every time we found a new one, obviously we rechecked the price, and it was 5 or $6 more on Jay's French Project. Every time we found more, they went up and up and up. And if the card hadn't moved by the time we put the 16th copy on, I might drop it 5 bucks. I want them gone. I want to be the lowest all the time during the spikes. And, uh, yeah, I, I did the same with Stoneforge Mystic. I, I sold my first few at 75, and then I was like, I'm not pushing my luck. Put it to 69, put it at 64. Just yep. Absolutely. Uh, and during spikes, I've actually found, let's say I have 10 of a Jace Friends Prodigy. I will take all 10 and put them online, or I'll put eight online, hold two back yep. due to TCG errors, Crystal Commerce, uh, uh, one thing that customers don't under, uh, realize or quite understand is when a store says that uh, the system messed up, sometimes it is honest and sometimes Crystal Commerce or TCG Player will have a little hiccup during busy season and create oversells. So we've started taking uh, precautions to protect ourselves by holding a couple hot cards back. It hasn't actually bit us yet, but it has saved us a few times. Yeah, so that actually happened to me specifically with Stoneforge Mystic, like I was just talking about. I, I was in Vegas, and I knew I had eight Stoneforge Mystics at home. And so I I listed four to see if they'd sell, and that they were all just gone instantly within like three minutes. And I hit refresh, but I didn't get an email notification saying that they sold, and there was no record of the sale in the TCG player system. So I just, like, I, I had no way to verify whether or not they sold, so I, I chalked it up to just, like, an inventory error or, like, me hitting a button or not hitting save or whatever. So then I relisted another four and then another four after that, and I ended up selling 12 because, like, 30 minutes later, I got the email notification for the first place that that sold, and I had to fight tooth and nail with TCG uh, via an email to get my fees refunded for that first sale that I had to refund because, like... They, they screwed me over. I'm not even a uh, Crystal Commerce sync seller. I don't have products on Amazon or eBay or anything like that. I just have TCG Player. But even just on TCG Player, I managed to uh, run into a little software error where I didn't get a notification for a sale while the inventory still disappeared. Yeah, I think this particular spike was uh, is larger, or the, the amount of sales were, because people weren't expecting the new format. They were all expecting the BNR, so they were refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. They see the BNR and they see the other announcement for the new format. They were already there, ready to go. Yeah. Whereas if this happened on, you know, like a another Wednesday Monday that it yeah. wasn't as hyped, that that it probably wouldn't have been as bad. Yep. The 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 cards have just been flying, man. It's it's so awesome to see 
the, the sales, but it's also really, uh, uh, really re reassuring to see the community willing to put the money on the line and buy the cards. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, like I said, I think a big part of this is just, uh, being frustrated with standard to, to such a large extent early on and players who were planning on throwing a lot of money into Oko's are being willing to, uh, dip their toes into other formats that are just recently announced. They're just like the, the players who can't afford modern, the players who don't want to throw $400 for scalding tarns. They suddenly have $400 gets them probably two decks in this format. Oh, absolutely. It, it's, it scales, uh, you know, eight years ago or so, whenever they introduced modern, if you look at legacy prices, they were similar to where modern prices are now, you know, for a solid deck, twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500. Yep. And that's, that's when point. modern got introduced and legacy just trailed on being more expensive and modern is, you know, it, it's now up to that point. It's up to a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars for, for the playable decks. Yep. And I think that's the limit for wizards. You know, they don't pay attention to the secondary market, but they hear the cries of the, well, the player base. I don't saying they don't pay attention to the secondary market probably Quotation is not true. Marks it is <laughs> it is they they do not acknowledge is the better yeah. term, right? Like they they yeah, refuse to acknowledge the secondary market. They pay attention to it absolutely when they make the EV of a of a commander deck, when they make the EV of a uh, of a base set or just any sort of master set, and calculating what certain mythics should be in it, that kind of thing. Uh, and speaking of that, I have a question for both of you because I one of my uh, called shots earlier this year was uh, in response to the commander deck reprints that being lackluster was that I thought and am still considering the belief that there will be a commander focused print run of something at the end of this year uh, in the spot of unstable in the spot of uh, uh, ultimate masters where there was some crazy set early December that just came out of nowhere and blindsided everyone because we got the notifications for Ultimate Masters around this time. It was like late October, early November when we got uh, information about UMA in response to the whole uh, Mythic Edition kerfuffle and everyone getting box toppers. Uh, but there was another product announced, announced as a strong word because it was on the Wizards channel on the Twitch stream uh, and they announced a mystery booster. I don't know if you guys saw that. Yeah, they're going to have like sealed events at... Uh... At like the PT at Richmond? Yeah, so there's there's some sort of uh, limited event with these mystery boosters. They are not answering questions outside of, no, there's not reserve list cards in them, you stupid idiot. Um, so that was basically the only question they were willing to tolerate. And uh, the fact that they, that they strongly hinted that there would be multiple of these events and they would happen at uh, GPs probably around the world. And so my question to you guys is, do you think this is uh, commander related? Do you think this is pioneer related? I think like, it's, what it I think it's uh, an equal likelihood about 50 50 that it's commander or pioneer i would i would say the likelihood is is equal like on the basis of like all, the fact that it's close to pioneer and like they're like oh we're doing the pioneer it's going to be a thing and all of a sudden you know it's it's a format where people are going to need these cards that you know were you know they just they sold off because they were banned in other formats and junk or whatever you know all that's true but also uh, Commander 2019 sucked. It was really bad. So, um, I, I think you're I, right. I think Jason, they could do some 50, sort of 50. Commander's Arsenal type deal or something. Because a Commander's cards. Arsenal would only have like 50 or 20 cards. That's that's not going to well, satiate. Well, like Commander the... Masters then or whatever. Like you know, so, something. I think you're right on the 50 50. Uh, from my side, as as a start, I really just hope it's Commander. There's no better product for the local yeah. game than Commander. That's it's that's the where I'm only at. thing that keeps us running. And I and don't think got, that there are. We've I don't got think so there many are any twenty-five cards. plus dollar cards that they can't even really put in the Commander decks, even if they were inclined to print a card that costs more than eight dollars, which they're not. Yeah, I I am hesitant to believe that there is anything uh, in such desperate need of a reprint that is legal in Pioneer as of now. Like, there's, there's no $100 Scalding Tarns. I mean, based on what we... I don't have the data in front of me, but Jason's Prodigy is probably, like, theoretical... Or Oko, I guess, is the most expensive card in the format. But, like, Oko, um, other standard legal cards, and then Jason's Prodigy are the the premier cards in the format uh, price-wise. But And none of those are really, like, reprintable, right? It's not like you can't print Jason's Prodigy in a Master Set unless you get really weird with the double-sided sheets. You can't put Oko in it. You can't put, uh... Like, you can't just fill the set with garbage. It has to have some sort of marquee attraction. So I'm leaning towards Commander, I think, for this mystery product. 
I think it's worth considering that the Pioneer format started RTR, which is the uh, the start of the meteoric rise of Magic, right? RTR was so massively printed, and every set past that has been bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's, there's so many copies of these uh, Pioneer cards that are just going to flood the market now that people, there's a, there's a desire for them. Whereas, yeah, like I mean, said, the, the $25 Commander cards, they can't throw in a pre-con because by the time it hits print, it's $50. Yeah. Those are the things that the community really needs. And uh, some people will whine about it, but the vast majority of people that play will love them. Yes. So uh, what does a Commander set look like? Because they've never done a Commander set. They've done well, it depends, Iconic Masters. It depends what it is. Is it a... Well, is it a set packs. that we're going to draft? Yeah. Or is it's, it... It's a mystery. It, that's all Gavin told us. Is It's a mystery. Like, if it's just like, here's here's some packs and they got cards you want in them, that's cool. I hope they don't try to do a set that we're going to draft, because that would just be dumb. Like, to try to build a draft format around the fact that we need a reprint of Aura Shards and Rhystic Study. Like, you know, I, I, there are a ton of cards that need reprinted. I think you just put them in booster packs. You're like, hey, some of these have a bloom tender and I'm going to town. I think if you do that, they'll be popular and the singles will get out there and you don't have to do all the crap of trying to balance a draft format. You know, because it's a lot of work. It's hard and they don't do a very good job of it. And speaking locally, we very rarely fire drafts at any stores. Uh, The community has, at least here, has moved away from that kind of magic. When I got back into it, it was a bunch of, you know, older guys that liked drafting, liked to chain. They would do four or five drafts a night. But here at our store, at the new set comes out the day of, we may get one or two drafts firing. People are just more excited to do the sealed stuff or the, the constructed stuff or sit and play EDH with their new cards. Do you think Arena has had a huge impact on the limited formats for like LGS style play? I think so. I if if I wanted a draft, I would not put my under my pants on. I would sit in my underwear in my living room and do it. You know, if I yeah. wanted to play standard, it's the similar similar thing. I don't if I can do it from my house, I don't want to drive forty minutes to do it. Yep. No. So, it, it from a from a store perspective is it's actually it sounds like it's hurt by cutting drafts in standard, but we have more and more players stepping in and asking. You know, hey, I saw Arena, I saw my friend playing, or I've started grinding. I'm interested in getting out and meeting people and playing in store. So Arena is uh, one of the bigger things that we can contribute success to for at least our store of bringing new players in. Yep. It's just got that, like, candy crush effect almost of people see people who are in Hearthstone and people who play League of Legends, they see this Facebook ad that was specifically cultivated for them that has magic on it. And then they're just open to a whole new world that they've never even considered or thought of, even though they're right next door to it. Yeah, the the common person I've interacted with that just walks in the store randomly has heard Magic, or the game of Magic, because it's existed for 25 years. But they've never spent the time to sit down and learn because it is a complicated game to learn. Uh, yep. I sat down and did the Arena tutorial, and anybody can sit down and figure the game out by using the software. And it takes no time. Yep, absolutely. Oh. You know, they've did, been... did the tutorial crash on you at all? No, I, I I haven't had any problems with Arena. I know you've had problems with Arena, though, Jason, haven't you? Yeah, I don't like it. I haven't had software issues, though. And I'm playing on a laptop, so, like, if anyone's going to have issues, it'd be me. But, I like, I realize that everybody's having issues, so, you know... How's your uh, Chandelier project coming along? Well, Chandelier is a really frustrating game to speed run, but I'm, my new computer is going to be arriving soon. I'm going to get set up, and uh, I'm going to drink and play Chandelier on Twitch, and maybe some people would like to join me and watch. So that'll be a thing I do. I mean, I might just play Chandelier casually because like, it's a fun game to watch people play, but speed running it? Okay, so a five-minute aside here. Um, <laughs> to speed run Chandelier, what you do is you pick red and you pick the easy difficulty level. You go to a village, you sell everything in your deck that is a uh, creature or an artifact. You hope that 
with the you know RNG on the basis of what the cards are worth, you get at least a thousand gold. Then you walk around into those like mounds that pop up, and you hope that you have um, one of the ones that either lets you buy a Shivan Dragon for three gems or a thousand gold. If you don't have a thousand gold, you have to go get a thousand gold and hope you don't run into that thing before there. If you get a Shivan Dragon, then you go into the the dungeons. And you run over the dice, and then the dice are either like plus two life in your next game, or start the 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 game with a random creature out of your deck. Well, the only creature in your deck is a Shivan Dragon, and then like two copies of Burrowing and a copy of like Immolation. <laughs> you know, so like you sold most of your deck, so it fills your deck up to forty with uh, with basic lands. So you're just going to draw random basics the whole game. And you're going to hope that the blue mage doesn't boomerang or unsummon your Shivan Dragon. You hope the white mage doesn't swords your Shivan Dragon. You hope the black mage doesn't turn one oubliette off a dark ritual your Shivan Dragon. And you hope the green mage doesn't just race you. So you have to hit all five dungeons without any of them doing that, which happens a lot. Uh, you have to get a Shivan early. And if you can do all that, you can conceivably beat the game in 11 minutes. Uh, my personal best time is 22 minutes. Um, that still I, seems like relatively good. If I beat 15 minutes, which is my goal, I knock Frank Karsten off the leaderboard, which is my goal. I would love to knock Frank Karsten off the leaderboard. So I'm going to play this <laughs> dumb, frustrating game where like you just get blown out, you know, because the red mage goes, you know, ball lightning, lightning bolt, and you lose be- before you could get there with your Shivan dragon. Um, you know, uh, you spend seven minutes trying to find a Shivan dragon and you don't get it. And you're like, well, now I can't get, you know, a good time now. Um, or you spend the whole time wandering around the map, trying to find the last dungeon and you can't, um, which has happened to me. Um, it's a frustrating game, but if I'm drinking, um, and getting upset, I think that will be really entertaining to people who are interacting with me in chat. So, um, that'll be a thing I do. And, so where, um, where's this leaderboard? Is it like on message boards on Usenet? It, you guys well, use the old internet as well? I, it's <laughs> whatever the speed run. You type in Chandelar speed run. It brings up speedrun.net or whatever where, you know, where all the stuff is. It's probably attached to the dojo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, remember the dojo? <laughs> I don't I don't get that reference. Yeah, because oh, it was Jesus before Christ. you were born. There was a website called the dojo where there was like a, an IRC chat where we used to talk to people. You can read some of the greatest tournament reports of all time. The schools of magic. It's a, it's a treasure trove of history. Yep, go on the internet way back machine and find it. So yeah, I'll be shindling soon. But apparently that's like everybody's chandeliring now. So like I, I, I'm going to look like I'm a copycat, but I don't really care about that. <laughs> um, I have a friend who's tried to uh, get every achievement in the duels of the Planeswalkers games. That and, sounds worthwhile. Uh, well, uh, there's one achievement where you have to go through 54 steps to get like it's like a puzzle or whatever where you, you're given all these random abilities and creatures and crazy interactions that would never happen in a game of magic mm-hmm. uh so i have uh yeah i have a friend who's trying to unlock all of the achievements and duels of the planeswalkers the old xbox games for magic and there is one of the puzzles that requires you to go through uh 25 steps with this ridiculous great whale spitting image sneak attack deck um that involves like spitting imaging your your great whale to generate mana and then like sneak attacking it in and casting demonic consultation then passed in flames uh it, it's this 25 step uh craziness this is something that you can do in a video game it is on the <laughs> it is on the Xbox platform yes M- magic online would crash on step 4 <laughs> Yeah, so uh, step one, cast Demonic Collusion with Buyback. Step two, cast it with Buyback again. Step three, you sneak attack to play Great Whale, etc., etc., etc. Step 16, flashback Coercion. Make your opponent discard the only card. Step 17, cast Tendrils targeting the opponent, leaving three mountains, one swamp, and one island on tap. After all the triggers, they should go from 65 to 39 life. If that didn't happen, start over. Step 18... <laughs> Step 25, flashback Tendrils of Agony targeting the opponent for the win. 
how do you figure that out if you don't just go into the game's code and just like how did to... you must never have played vintage that sounds like a reasonable turn in vintage <laughs> I don't know. I, I just remember my friend back in college trying to get this achievement, and then he just sent this list of uh, instructions to me over Messenger, and I was just like, what? what? I I don't even know. Yeah, I wouldn't make it any way through this at all. It uh, seem worth it. My time has <clears throat> some value, I think. Well, speaking of value, there's one more thing I want to talk about before we get into uh, Pick of the Week, and that is an allegation that I've seen repeated all over the internet uh, that there was what they are classifying as insider trading, whatever that means. Okay, um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good topic. Yep. So there were Pioneer cards that started going up last week, especially on MTGO. Um there, by pioneer cards, I mean cards that are after Smuggler's Innistrad. Copter, Dig Through Time, yeah. Sahili Rai. Um, so the, the fact that we didn't see a similar spike in cards uh, from Innistrad or or, or before um, says that somebody knew when Pioneer started, and uh, somebody knew that there was going to be a new a new format, and that therefore it's insider trading, and this is very bad, and MTG finance people are scumbags, etc. Yeah, so there's a couple opinions I have on this. And the first is that it is definitely possible that there are people out there. It's not even possible, just likely. It is likely that there are some small number of individuals out there who receive access to information that they shouldn't. And that they use that information to make purchases that they shouldn't. And that is what you are classifying as, quote, insider trading. Uh, there's a couple caveats to this. And the first is that nothing that these people are doing or have been doing in the past affects you at all really directly um that the, the prices settle back down as we've discussed in this podcast uh death right will no longer be a 15 dollars card within the next 24 hours and even four weeks down the road it'll be even less than that and by the time you need your cards for gp phoenix it'll be even less than that uh the second being that these are card prices that are jumping often because of information that is not people getting that access early. Uh, in this case, there's one situation where, yes, some of these cards spiked on the 11th of this month or whatever, um, but there was also a situation where Wizards Event Reporter sent out a message to local game stores announcing the addition of Pioneer in Wizards Event Reporter uh, like four days ago or five days ago. It was like last week. I don't remember specifically when, but, um, and Dan Bach posted on Facebook saying, Hey, did anyone else get this announcement? And a lot of store owners also shared on Facebook and Twitter saying, Hey, did anyone else get this weird announcement? It looks like there's something called pioneer. So this is a format that we've been talking about for years that we knew all knew was coming, that there was going to be some bridge between modern and standard, we just didn't know this specific exact starting point. Some people guessed it would start at the new card frame in M15. Some people started cons of, guessed cons of Tarkir. There's a lot of wild guessing around, going around. But basically everybody knew there was going to be a format soon. The Smuggler's Copter was legal. And if you were paying attention and keeping your finger on the pulse. So while there are situations where I think cards have spiked because of people getting information that they shouldn't. A lot of the time it's just like some moto bug where jace got unbanned early or stoneforge got unbanned early and people made decisions based on that like or th some wizards article gets leaked early or it gets put out on the internet like the dominaria leak remember that where like the entire rules thing of dominaria got leaked in chinese three weeks early and then cards spiked and then people posted the magic subreddit four weeks later going like insider trading looks like land world from alpha spiked super yeah it's because we knew it was in the set two months early so, yes. Uh, so it's it's easy to call insider trading when. What does that even mean? It's a buzzword that you can use on the internet and sound smart. Uh, it's it's easy to call it when you're uh, you're so far behind. Smart people, like you said, knew this was coming. You knew that if it included Kaladesh, something like uh, Torrential Gearhulk would be powerful. I personally, in the store, uh, probably about six months ago, started pulling cards I knew were super underpriced like mythics and rares that would be good in whatever format. It doesn't hurt if I don't sell uh, hanger back walkers at their current price because they're only going to go up. So I stashed away 12 of them 
And guess what? They all sold when I relisted them today. Uh, if you just think about it and use your brain and figure out what's going to happen and just throw the cards behind, I'm in the position of a store that we do have that kind of inventory. And that's why when we list, you know, you list 50 copies of a card that just spiked. It looks like it could be insider trading. But like you said, the the were email, the, the was re event reporter email came out and a lot of people understood what that meant and used that knowledge to their advantage. And, and, and now it wasn't there, hidden there. Well, there are some allegations uh, from people that claim they operated with advanced knowledge that was verified by a, a wizard's employee. And um, I, don't, I did not see that. I don't have a huge problem with that even uh, because I think the people that are angry, re angrily reacting to this is because they're reactive people and they behave reactively, which is why they wouldn't have been in a position to benefit from this in any case. Right. Because like they're just buying reactively like everybody else. And they're like, they're mad. They have to pay $15 for a death right. Shaman have and, to oh, is a strong word there. Well, yeah, but that's how they feel. They, yes, they I, I know, everyone I know, I know. gets that little feeling in the pit of their stomach where they're like, "Oh, the fear of missing out." It's, I mean, it's grips. Now I got to lash out at people who were making a decision either on the basis of some inside knowledge or not some inside knowledge. So these people are mad that they're paying this price now. But does that mean they would have preferred to have paid the price before? And if so, they would have had to have known, which means they're operating with advanced knowledge. And that's what they wanted. So at the same time, they're bemoaning the fact that they couldn't do that. They're lashing out at the people who did. So, like, you're not morally righteous. You're not superior if, given the knowledge, you would have reacted that way. So basically, you're upset that you didn't take the time to cultivate those sort of connections where you could have that information. And, uh, you know, if you're the kind of person that is like mad that people are buying these cards and and would never, ever, even if you knew, have uh, bought in advance, just calm down. Let the price to settle because everybody's in that FOMO buying frenzy, buying reactively, freaking out. People are spending a lot of money on cards that are going to be banned. You know, people are spending a lot of money on cards that are going to be unplayable. Nobody knows anything about this format now. Let's all just calm down. Let's all just take a breath and let's all realize that people are going to make money off Magic the Gathering and it's not hurting anything. You know, it's not ruining your enjoyment of the game. It's just people making money. I really want some, some stuff. Yeah, I really want somebody to come out and write an article uh, saying that they made like X thousands of dollars on like Sliver Queen's a good example, right? Like Sliver Queen, somebody got insider information about Modern Horizons having slivers or snow themes. I want somebody to come out and say that like, yes, I made five thousand dollars on Sliver Queen and I use it to pay my daughter's medical bills. Or and then watch like that. Like, look, yeah, I'm, I'm not sounding super articulate right now because I'm trying to be nice and it's difficult. Uh, I don't really have anything nice to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay jason i got a message on reddit from a guy who bought a ton of sahilis and that wasn't insider trading um he just bought a bunch of sahilis because he's smart and uh he met us at gp detroit that's a thing that you can do he had dj sign a wrecked gaunti and yeah. uh yeah he bought a thousand sahilis and now they're 15 and he's like how do i get my 1500 so he's probably gonna try to sell them to 95 so um <laughs> That's somebody that uh, just bought Sahili's on the basis of they were suspiciously cheap. And he didn't know. He just guessed. And now he looks like a genius. And uh, those are the stories I want to hear about. I don't want to hear about the people that are upset because they could never have predicted a thing that was already predicted by the fact that Frontier existed. You know, uh, in the Discord, a lot of people uh, have been talking about cards that have the potential. And a lot of those people, like you're saying, the smarter people made their actions and uh, I'm glad that the Discord is something that exists, that people who are serious about making money or even just making the game cheaper to play for themselves have the spot to interact. And I'll pitch to Patreon. If you guys aren't a member of it for, it's what, a dollar a month just for the Discord, it's completely worth every bit of it. And uh, even the, the spreadsheet, that's I'm about to move up to that tier here in a couple, uh, couple weeks. And I can't wait to get all that information the day that it's available. It's such a, a resource that you have to have if you want to do this right. 
We have like 400 posts in the Pioneer chat already. Holy shit. Yeah. And I made that today. That's that's insane. Yeah. And we are we are very close to I mean we can close out the cast and just sort of run with this here, but we are we are very close to hitting one last goal that we need. Uh 23 more patrons. It doesn't even have to be a high level. So any 23 different patrons who are new, if you're listening to this and you're not, you can contribute literally one dollar to Corbin having to put on a real physical Merfolk cosplay and then go play a GP in it in the middle of December and then go swim in a lake afterwards or some body of water. A pool, it's undecided as to what the body of water will be, but he has to wear this costume in a physical body of water. (laughs) He might not make it out of that body of water, but that's not our problem. Go to the LGS, tell people at the LGS, hey, for a dollar you can contribute to Corbin dying because he's going to die. Corbin can't swim like in a bathing suit, how is he going to swim in a heavy merfolk costume that's going to soak up a bunch of water and become like super heavy? So, is it possible the merfolk channel through the costume and he becomes an actual fish? I'd be fine with that. Like the South Park episode. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're referencing. I haven't watched South oh. Park since 2003, but yeah, sure, man. <laughs> <laughs> So That'll yeah, go, just just uh, we also have our intern whatever. hard at work on uh, working on the exact metrics for the what we are calling the B Dub suffering fast or something like that. We don't have an official name for it, but the short version is that Corbin volunteered for this, this himself. He put himself on the cross for this one, but he offered to give up Buffalo Wild Wings for two consecutive days for every dollar that our Patreon amount increased since the start of this. Excuse me, since the start of this month. So starting October 1st until the very end of this month, so you have a few days left if you're listening to this now, uh, our intern is hard at work calculating the exact amount of days that Corbin will be banned from eating Buffalo Wild Wings uh, starting in mid-November. So that is something you also have looked for, something you also have to look forward to. Another thing we're going to do on this podcast is we're going to start making some spicier bets. We found uh, reasonably priced spicy gummy bears online. Someone in the Discord said that to us. So DJ and I are going to make a spicy bet right now. There are mystery packs coming out. We don't know if they are Commander or uh, if they are um, Pioneer. So I'm going to bet that they are either Pioneer or something that's not Commander. And DJ thinks they're Commander. So if DJ's right, I have to eat a spicy gummy bear and try to podcast as normal. And uh, if DJ's wrong about it being Commander, um, he has to eat the spicy gummy bear. So that's a, a thing we're going to do. As soon as we find out the next episode, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're blowing your Patreon money on. Thank you for going to patreon.com slash brainstorm brewery and just giving us money bear, right? to hurt each other with. It's just one gummy bear, right? Yeah, but it's going to be super hot. So enjoy. Shouldn't you? We should set that. You should set the rules. You know, you can't drink milk as you put the gummy bear in your mouth. Uh, this is me and DJ. So we oh, don't have to right. make You're... those sort of rules. Yeah. That's understood. You're not cowards. Yeah. So <laughs> we can block warriors. Yep. We can block warriors all day. So without further ado, I think we were going to go to the segment you've all been waiting for. What is our. Oh, geez. We still have pick of the week to do. Of the week. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Time for the pick of the week. Uh, my pick of the week is tireless tracker its current price is kind of high do you think it's got a upshot on the basis of pioneer uh it's i think this is a card that probably won't be great in the initial drafts of the format because i think there are going to be very powerful things that people are doing uh, I think this is a card that you wait and see on, but I think this is something that you can pick up if it goes down just even a dollar or two more. It's like seven or eight right now, and I think it has a little bit more time to fall, but I also think that this could easily be like a 13 or $14 card. If de- if death rate can go to 13 on day one, this can go to 13 yeah, We had that discussion earlier. I asked the boys what they thought Tracker would be, and they were both uh, positive at 10+. plus. And one of them was pretty sturdy on 15 if the format slows down enough and becomes yeah. a mid-range fest. 
Like, I, I think the initial f- drafts of this format are going to be very, like, Aetherworks marvel or, like, emrical or turbo Rampy or crazy shit is going. And then I think things will hit, get or hit with a Or some sort hammer. of, like, red prowess deck that's going to beat everyone on turn three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that there will be cards that get banned. I think Tireless Tracker is, uh... It could be a safe place to put your money. I also like Thing in the Ice. I think I like Thing in the Ice, too. A card that just recently got uh, its knees broken by the Faithless Looting banning. And this is a format where this card could flourish without Faithless Looting as sort of a uh, control type of card using, like, you, you get, like, Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time in this format, a chart of course. Maybe. Can, um, so I think Th- Thing in the Ice is another, another... I actually like Thing in the Ice more than Tireless Cracker, Tracker. I've talked myself into it. Well, that's a bonus pick of the week. DJ's going to put both of those in the spreadsheet. And uh, if you have access to the spreadsheet, we're like, why is there two picks? Well, because Corbin isn't here, and uh, we're feeling generous. I got mine ready to go. Uh, I really like uh, Goblin Rabble Master. Uh, during the cons and uh, uh, origin time, it peaked around $20. It is, it's not the flashy mythic. Uh, but you can get them now for two dollars, two fifty. This card is one of my uh, my most infamous misses because a friend of mine who trusts me very dearly about everything finance and magic related was, and he's a very very avid red player. Was like, hey DJ, should I buy this card? And I just said like, no, it's garbage. The tokens have to attack every turn. It's pure like Goblet Assault from Shards of Alar. Right? It's it was garbage. Like, don't do it. And uh, swing and a miss on that one. The card is so powerful in a format where you do have man, one mana dorks, so like the goose and land of Warals and such. It's it's uh, it's its army in a can, and I think that these kind of tools, like if we get devolved into the mid range fest, it doesn't overcommit to the board, and it's such a safe pickup at two fifty. Even if you just want a play set, to yeah, play with, I, I, like I wouldn't card. miss on this card at all. I have a pick of the week. This is as much on its playability as a, a huge price discrepancy I found. Um, if you look at the price of a card called Finale of Devastation, it is 17 on Card Kingdom and it is 15 on Channel Fireball, but the the market price right now is $9 on Finale of Devastation. Um this is a card that looks like it's in the middle of being bought out because if you look at like all the cards, uh, copies under ten dollars, there's people that have one or two copies. Um, the uh, the lowest price uh, uh, for somebody that has a, an entire play set of this card is uh, ten dollars plus a dollar shipping, and that's for lightly played. So it looks like it's in the process of being bought out. So I think the the price is going to restructure here in a little bit. So. I don't think you have much time, but I, I think Finale of Devastation is a $15 to $17 card that is $10 on TCG Player right now, and um, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know why it's going up. I don't know if this is going to be that good in Pioneer or if it's just uh, something in the new standard with the banning of Field of the Dead. I don't know what's going on, but I do know that there's a huge price discrepancy, and that's something you should take advantage of. Channel Fireball is not that much more than TCG player, even if Card Kingdom usually is. So a, a discrepancy like that is is worth... Uh, I, I think the TCG player price is too low. Yep. Seems good. And Corbin will... He said he's going to put his pick of the week and his breaking bulk in the spreadsheet. We will see if that rings true. So this is a, uh, this is a, a situation where if you have listened to the podcast... Um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get access to this pick. So only people that go to Patreon.com/slash/BrainstormBrewery and give us ten dollars will have access to Corbin's pick. But we're not doing that to get you to go to the Patreon because it's Corbin's pick. I, I would not subscribe to the Patreon just for that. <laughs> well, we we seem to barely scrape through another Corbinless episode somehow, some way, but it has, it has happened. Uh, John, where can people, where can people find you? Are you on the socials? Are you, uh, I am always in the discord. Uh, social media is John P Jansen on Twitter. Uh, and you can find me every day slaving away at the cardboard at win condition games in Kennesaw. Uh, if you guys have any questions in the, in your part of the discord, feel free to message me personally. If I can't have the answer for you, I will find it. 
there you go. Uh, Jason, you, where's your pin tweet at? Uh, I'm Jason E. Alt on the Twitters, and I got a pin tweet on that. And you can go there and you can click on all my stuff, um, including the project I really care about, which is my movie podcast. Sounds good. And uh, this is Douglas slash DJ Johnson. Uh, you can find me at most North American Grand Prix slash Magic Fest buying under the 95 MTG banner. We always have the best prices uh, on singles at GPs and Magic Fests. We always have the highest buy prices for most of your modern standard and legacy staples. Uh, you will see our trademark hot board on, projected onto a TV screen or two in the Magic Fest area. You can find us at the big red banner. Uh, and I personally myself sell under Card Garden on TCG Player. So that is all from us, the Magic Finance experts of magic i don't i don't really uh, fade j just fade out jj just slowly drop this audio to an unlistenable level and then they won't be able to say and then play yeah. music over that and that'll be great there's a lot you need to cut out of this episode so good luck with so. that i don't think so good luck once you cut all the bruises out of the banana see if you got anything left This was a good episode. Yeah, whatever. Everything, you always think it's a bad episode. Yeah, because Corbin's on it usually. <laughs>